good evening. Would you stand with and worship with us tonight? I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my sin. Still I may. I was breathing, but not alive. my failures I try to hide it was my sin still I'm ready you call my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness to your glorious day you call my name and I ran out that grave out of the darkness to your glorious day now your mercy has saved my soul now you're free Have you guys ever had somebody send you something that just makes you rethink every decision you've ever made in your life? <laughs> our, our sound guy, Chris Clark, sent me a video this week, and he sent it to Chris too, but I want to share it with you guys before we get started here tonight. I have a lot of respect for pastors, though. That's a very hard job. Like, it's definitely harder than stand-up. Like, as a comedian, you can kind of talk about whatever you want. My dad, every Sunday, has to just do a new book report about the same book. And people will send him mean emails. So like, this Easter service sounds a lot like what you did a few years ago. But like, yeah, sorry, the material has not changed. <laughs> Man, I hated doing book reports when I was a kid. <laughs> And he's right, that's what I do for a living now. Um, I thought that was really funny, so uh, Chris and I wanted to share that with everybody. Hey, we got a lot of stuff coming up this week. Uh, first of all, happy birthday, everybody. Uh, some of you guys don't realize it, but you're 34. Some of you guys have aged horribly. <laughs> some of you guys look pretty good for 34. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the college kids in the back love it. Um, no, the church is actually tomorrow, the church is turning 34. And it's always really easy for me to remember because my wife's birthday is the same birthday, has the same birthday as the church. And I tell her all the time, all the weirdos and degenerates are born in October. So 
Congratulations. Happy birthday, guys. <laughs> uh, we do have a lot. This is a picture of the first couple. Of, that's the very first service that the church had. For those of you guys that don't know, the Fountain Plaza right down here at the corner of uh, 32nd and Connecticut, that's where the church started. It started in one storefront, and over the couple, uh, course of a couple of months, it had moved into three storefronts. But yeah, we've been teasing Chris all week at how brown his hair was then, 34 years ago. He even had a gray spot then, though. I mean, he blames it on being struck by lightning, which is true. He really was struck by lightning. But I think that even in the first week of being in ministry here at Christ Community, you guys had already turned his hair gray. <laughs> huh? I did have hair, but I've been working for Chris for the last 14 years. I had hair when I started. I did grow up in the church. I started here in 94. Chris baptized. We started after they had built the first edition. So I was uh, almost 13 when we started. And Chris baptized me that same year. And we had to look it up. But uh, yeah, it's, it's weird to think that the church used to just be the basketball court. That was it. When we first started coming here, there was the basketball court. If Barry's office down here was a nursery, and I think it was Tara's office was a nursery. So, and we've grown this big ever, ever since. So Chris said they started out, that first week they had 114 people, and it was kind of like the first time we had the Sunday night service. We had well over 100 people here for the first Sunday night service. Uh, Chris didn't have quite the drop-off that we did. He said that they, next week they leveled out at 70. Uh, our second week on Sunday night, we leveled out at about 15. <laughs> but the church has grown steadily every year since 1990, even during COVID, even when we were shut down because we kept meeting on the parking lot, we didn't lose any ground. So that's something that's really exciting and uh, probably the biggest milestone, I think, in Chris's mind, and as well as Bob and I, is that we have over, in those 34 years, there have been over 900 people that have been baptized in this church. So that's something that's really exciting. And there, you, you know, like I said, I was baptized here. I think a lot of you guys were baptized here. I did my first baptism as a pastor here. And it was one that was really special to me because it was my grandpa. So, like, I think for a lot of us, there are a lot of life milestones that have happened here. So, this is, it's always really exciting to celebrate the birthday of the church. That being said, we are going to be doing baptisms next week right after late service. So, um, this is your last chance to do it in the river this year. Well, I say that. Chris and I do have hip waders, and we will go down and baptize you in our waders because it's getting too cold <laughs> after this week. We, uh, it's been three or four years ago, but we went and baptized somebody in late November. It was the week of Thanksgiving, and she will always remember that. <laughs> Chris and I really did go down there in our waders, but... Um, uh, that will be next Sunday, right after service. So if you want to get on the list, if you want to be baptized, then come and talk to me afterwards or call Chris tomorrow morning and we will get you on the list for that. Uh, if not, then come and just be a part of it because it is such a major life event for people and it's so exciting when you come up out of the water and you've got a whole creek bank full of people that are cheering and, and clapping for you, welcoming you into the family. So... That will be next, next Sunday, right after late service. Then we got the harvest party coming up. Um, Amy was really excited because she got all of the volunteer spots filled. Uh, but something that we've noticed over the last several years, it's really easy to sign up. It's a little harder to show up. <laughs> So, that being said, if you didn't get a chance to sign up, then go ahead and let Amy know that you can be here for something and she will, she will plug you in because there's always plenty of stuff to do. So, uh, also, you can start bringing your candy. If you are going to donate candy, we can't ever get enough of that. Like I said last week, we stopped counting after we had 1,500 kids check in last year because we ran out of sign-up forms. So, 
get some candy. There's a big bucket. I think there's two buckets over there now, but you can just throw it in there every, every Monday and every Thursday. Amy comes in here and loads it all up and goes and stashes it all. So um, those will be empty again by next weekend. So uh, seems like I'm missing something. Am I missing something? Huh? Okay. Yep. Last thing. Um, and this is really something to celebrate on our birthday weekend like this. As of Friday morning, the church is officially debt-free. Yeah, that is something to be really proud of because in January, when we first started this pay down the debt campaign, we were over $200,000 in debt with some building um, expenses that we'd had and things like that. And in that time from January until Friday, we paid it off. So, and now we are going to, so Chris would also like for you guys to know if you were planning on making another donation to that debt fund, we do, the biggest thing that we wanted to do that for is we are in desperate need of a children's center here. And as soon as we are able, we plan on getting started on that. And it's going to be a big state-of-the-art thing. And it's going to be right out here, uh, really right behind where you guys are sitting here. And what we would like to do is be able to pay a quarter of that before we go into debt on the next thing. So we want to start raising money in the, in the building fund for that. So... If you were planning on making a donation, then go ahead and still do that because there are several of us that were going to do that and it will just go right into the, the biggest need that we have. And that's been a big need for a long time and it's going to clear up a lot of space. So we are looking forward to getting started on that hopefully in the next couple of years. So. All right, in our prayer time tonight, we've had a couple of people in the hospital. Joyce Carpenter was in the hospital, but she is home now. She was actually in service earlier this weekend, so she is doing a lot better. Jim Owen, who we have mentioned for the last couple of weeks, Jim is on hospice, and they were saying this morning that it's probably not going to be long, so um, keep him and his wife in your prayers. And then we had uh, another member, Lou Myers, she fell this week, and she is in the hospital right now. And then Rochelle Lord, a lot of you guys know Rochelle because she comes to this service. Um, She's a nurse and works in Springfield a lot of times, so she comes to church whenever she's available, and usually that's Saturday night, but she comes to this one every once in a while. Rochelle got in a really bad car wreck earlier this week, and um, she had had to have surgery to fix some things in in Springfield and she is still in the hospital up there and it's going to be it's going to be a while she if I remember right she broke her hip and or I can't remember if it was hip or pelvis but it was something that's pretty she had some pretty serious injuries so keep her in your prayers and then also all of those people that are in the the path of the hurricane the one that has gone through and now the the next one that's coming through um that's that is a bad deal for a lot of people, and, and they're having trouble getting emergency workers in. We have, there is a basket back there by the black table that is our information table. It is a special offering that we're taking up for the hurricane relief, so if you would like to give to that, that's back there. It's kind of the same thing that we, it's what we learned in the tornado. You know, we had uh, churches from all over the country that would get in touch with Chris and they would just send money and say, you guys know what the need is there and you know how to get this to where it needs to go. And that's exactly what we're going to do. There are all kinds of GMC churches on the East Coast, especially in the South, and we're going to start looking tomorrow morning, find some GMC churches there that can facilitate us sending money and I think, and don't quote me on this because I don't want to misspeak, but I think that our disaster team is maybe even looking at trying to get something together so that they can go and as soon as they're able. I mean, like I said, we all know what that's like. You get a bunch of volunteers that get in and they just start clogging things up and making things more difficult. But uh, at this church, you know, this church was a hub for volunteers. We had people... I can't remember what the, Tara knows the exact number of days, but for over two years, we didn't go a single day without having a volunteer team staying here in the church and going out and helping with the cleanup after the tornado. And 
they've got a lot bigger mess to clean up than we did. And I know that's hard for us to think about. But So here coming up in the next several months probably, we may be looking at putting a team together and going and seeing what we can do to help there. So keep those people in your prayers because like I said, I just saw in the news today that there's another one that's probably going to hit either today or tomorrow in Florida. So let's pray. God, we thank you for all of the blessings, and this evening especially, we thank you for what this church has meant to so many people. God, we thank you for the way that you have always blessed this church. God, we take time tonight to remember uh, the leadership that you have put in this church. We thank you for putting Chris here and for leaving him here for so long, which is such a rarity in the Methodist church, but God, because he is such a faithful leader and has raised up so many faithful leaders that have followed where your spirit has led and listened to your guidance. You have always used this church as a very powerful instrument for growing your kingdom. And we ask that for the rest of the lifetime of everyone that's here, that you would continue to do that. And God, we ask that your, your spirit and your mission would always be at the center of everything that we do. And God, we always thank you for the relationships that we have here too. For so many of us, we have relationships that are closer than family. And some of us are even lucky enough to have our actual family as our church family, which is such a blessing. And God, for everyone that can't be here this weekend because of different illnesses or injuries or, or things that are going on in their lives, for, especially for Jim and for Rochelle and for Lou and so many other people that couldn't be here this weekend that maybe weren't quite ready to have their names put on the list for the entire congregation to know about. God, we ask that you would heal and restore them. And that in every one of these cases, your will would be done with their bodies and with their spirits. And God, we thank you that we know that whatever the outcome is with any of us, whether it's these people that we've lifted up to you tonight that are on a prayer list because they're injured or ill, or for any of us that are sitting here tonight, that even when things don't go according to our plan, we can always trust that your plan is good. And if your plan is to call somebody home, then it's a victory for your kingdom. And God, that's why we come here every week. And that's why this church is so important to so many of us because your goodness and your mercy are so big that we can't even begin to fathom it. But God, with the time that we have here tonight to join together, we thank you that we have this opportunity to celebrate and to praise and to worship you. And we ask that your spirit would anoint us to do just that with the rest of the time that we have tonight and that you would prepare us to go out and share your good news with people when we're done here tonight. We ask all these things tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand and worship now. His blood, the wine, broken and 
Some of you guys know this, my father-in-law used to own an insurance agency, and he was someone that made a pretty good living selling insurance, but he would always be the first one to tell you, it's a scam. <laughs> Anytime you talk about insurance, he'd say, it's a scam, but you got to have it, because the government makes sure that you got to have it, and you know, I think in the last several years, we've seen how stuff like that can be a scam, especially like with all of the stuff that was going on with COVID and how the government run insurance and became this big juggernaut and we're, uh, we're getting medical advice from insurance companies rather than actual medical professionals most of the time uh, when that was happening. A couple of years ago, there was a lawyer that saw an opportunity there so he came up with his own little scam. He set up a little medical tent, and he had, a, he had a guarantee. You come to my medical tent, if I cure you, it's a flat fee of $50. And if I don't cure you, then I will give you $100. So there, one of these doctors that, um, he was kind of a know-it-all. He didn't like the idea of somebody doing this. Uh, so it, local doctor, he goes down, he's going to make a, he's going to publicly embarrass this guy. So he goes down and he has this made up ailment. And now remember, it says if you're cured of whatever it is that's bothering you, not just that I can diagnose it and tell you what's wrong, but I'm going to fix it right here on the spot. So the doctor comes in and he says, I've lost my taste and I, uh, I need you to fix it for me. You know, classic symptom of COVID, you lose your taste, you lose your smell. So he goes, okay. Uh, I can fix that. Come in here. And he sits him down and he takes something out of a drawer and he puts a couple of drops on his tongue and he goes, what are you doing? That's gasoline. You can't put that. And he goes, fixed it. <laughs> 50 bucks. So it makes him mad. And then the next day he's like, oh man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this guy. So the next day he comes in and you know, he's, his wheels are really spinning. And he's going to figure out something because he knows better than this stupid lawyer. You know, he's, a, he's an actual doctor. He knows, he knows medicine. So he's going to come up with something that you can't fix. So he comes in the next day and he says, I, I fell and hit my head and I have amnesia. I can't remember anything other than I woke up this morning. I didn't know where I was, didn't know who I was. Uh, I have amnesia. I need, it, I need it to be fixed. Well, come right in, have a seat. And he reaches in the drawer and he pulls out that same vial as yesterday. And he goes, ah, oh, you're not putting gasoline on my tongue again. He goes, gotcha, <laughs> 50 bucks. So the next day he comes in, and he, now, now he's got a plan. He says to himself, um, I'm going to tell him I can't see. 
My vision is fading. You know, he doesn't have any optometrist tools, and even if he does, giving me glasses doesn't cure it. I found one of his lawyer loopholes. So even if he tells me, well, you need to go get glasses, or even if he fits me with glasses, he didn't cure me. So he goes in, and he tells him, he sits down, and he says, I've got you this time. I'm having trouble seeing. My vision is fading. I can't, I can't make anything out. And the, doctor, or the lawyer just kind of puts his head down, and he goes, okay, you got me. Here's your $100. And as the doctor's walking out, he goes, hey, this is just a 50. <laughs> I thought that part was a lot funnier than any of the rest of it, so I'm a little disappointed that nobody laughed. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, dealing with people that are know-it-alls like that, it's really a pain. And I know that we've all had to do that in some capacity, especially when you know what you're doing. You know, if you have some kind of area of expertise and somebody, uh, somebody thinks that they know better than you and they just start trying to talk circles around you and wear you out, it just, it's exhausting. And it's frustrating to have to deal with those people. And in, with the church in Corinth, that's exactly what Paul is dealing with. Paul's dealing with a bunch of people that are, that are know-it-alls. So, and especially in 1 Corinthians 8, when he's dealing with this church, uh, he points out the number one thing that you guys put emphasis on is your knowledge. You know a lot of things. That's great. Just like the doctor in this fake story that thinks that he knows everything, the people in Corinth are very impressed with how much more they know than anybody else that is part of the church body, like worldwide. So, this church in Corinth, they think that they know theology better. They know the elements of faith. They know everything about Christian freedom. They know the Greek culture that they live in. They know all of the science and the superstition from all of the religions and things like that. So they know a little bit better than everybody else. And in chapter 8 here in 1 Corinthians, Paul addresses that because they're having a specific issue that... Uh, Paul is having to address. They're eating meat that's been sacrificed to these Roman and Greek gods. And when he addresses that, he says, now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know, but whoever loves God is known by God. So he says, we all have knowledge, we all know things, but if you notice what he's doing here, he's pitting two things against each other that probably most of us wouldn't do naturally. He's saying you either have knowledge or you have love. And those two things in this case are on opposite ends of the spectrum because they do two different things. You have knowledge, it puffs you up, puffs you up, puffs up your ego, puffs up your pride. If you have love, it builds someone else up. If you love God, then, and, and that is your motivation for anything that you do, is loving God and loving the people that he loves, then you're going to build them up and you're going to invest in that relationship so that they become better. And not because you have something that they don't have, but because the love of God is working now through two people rather than just one. So Paul's making a, a pretty... Pretty big contrast here. And he's writing to them because these Christians in Corinth, they're getting a, a little flippant about something that is kind of a moral gray area here. Kind of a scriptural gray area. Like these pagans are going to the temple and they're going through these pagan rituals and they're sacrificing meat to the idols and then you're going and eating it. And... You know, just like the Greeks in Paul's day, we have practices that we know that we shouldn't engage in because they're kind of a, a, a moral or a spiritual gray area like that, right? We have things that, you know, we, we look for loopholes. You know, God hates shedding innocent blood, but we revel in this whole idea of my body, my choice. Our culture celebrates the sacrifice of innocent blood. And necessita to necessitate that, we not only permit all sorts of sexual immorality, we celebrate it. We tell people that they should have pride in who they are. You should love yourself and follow your heart. 
And the worst thing of all is we try to recreate God in our image and worship an idol that looks like us rather than worship the Creator that put His image in us so that we'll look like Him. Our culture celebrates these things and it punishes people that don't celebrate these things. It's not even a matter of just live and let think and do things differently. It's you either do the things and celebrate the things that I like or you're a bad person and you must hate me. And that sort of thing I can deal with. Like the culture being like that, I can deal with that. It doesn't affect me in the least. You want to go along with all that stuff? Fine, it's your life. Do what you want. I can deal with that, but what we can't deal with is the church being wishy-washy about those things like the church in Corinth was. When the Bible clearly says that something is contrary to Jesus' commands, just because the culture says it's okay now, we don't have the ability to go, eh, there's probably a situation here or there where uh, we can make exceptions, things like that. And when we get admonished because we should love like Jesus for not engaging in worldly practices and we change our stance on things, that's a problem. And Paul points that out here. In verse 5, he says, even if there are so-called gods, you know, these, uh, the gods that they're sacrificing to here, even if they're so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods uh, and many lords, yet for us... There's but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there's but one Lord Jesus Christ, through him all things come and through whom we live. He's saying, you know what? We know. We know. It's just dead, empty pieces of wood and stone. They're sacrificing to just rocks and tree stumps. We get it. They're just lifeless pieces of wood. People make the same arguments about all sorts of practices that the world celebrates. And I don't just mean things like sexual immorality and abortion and, and blatant sin and things like that. But you know, we see t-shirts that say things like, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. Mm. I have a church bumper sticker, but if you cut me off on range line, I'm going to flip you off and cuss you out. That's why we don't have church bumper stickers. If you do or don't do something that offends me in some way, I'm going to take to social media and I'm going to rant about you and how you've made me a victim. Or, you know, people say things like, well, Jesus drank wine, so wine moms and wine dads unite. In, first, in, in verse 9 here, Paul goes on and he says, you know, are, you, are you free to do those things? Are you free to have a glass of wine? Are you free to say a curse word when you smash your thumb with a hammer? Are you free to do some of that stuff? Sure. Is it beneficial? Probably not. And that's what Paul says here in verse 9. He says, be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all of your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what's sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. Like I said, are you free to do these things? Sure. Are you free to curse under your breath when some Oklahoma driver cuts you off and then goes 10 miles an hour slower than the posted speed limit? It's always somebody from Oklahoma. Are you from Oklahoma? It's, it, okay. It, well, but it's different. In Kansas, they speed up to get in front of you, and then Oklahoma, they're just already that slow. I lived in Oklahoma for a while, and oh my gosh, everybody down there. Whatever the posted speed limit is, they're going 10 miles an hour slower. But in their defense, whatever the posted speed limit is, I'm going about 15 miles an hour faster. So I don't know that, that, I don't know that that's a good argument. But, you know, so is it, is it okay to do that? Sure. If you, when you, like when you're already running late, or is it okay to drink in moderation? Sure. But what's the benefit? 
More than that, how does doing any of these things where you got to say, ah, it's a little bit of a gray area, like, ah, I can do it in cer- certain circumstances, how does that build somebody else up? How does doing these things build up a brother and sister? How does that show God's love to somebody? And that's what Paul's pointing out here. What are you doing to show God's love to somebody else by engaging in something? And is it your freedom to do those things? Sure, absolutely. Is it beneficial in most cases? Probably not. And believe me, nobody would rather that be removed from the Bible more than me. I would love it. This is one of those things. I wish it wasn't in the Bible, but it is. And that makes my job in my life to form my life to what this says rather than try to find a loophole and make the Bible fit with what I want it to say. You know, we're called to love our brothers and sisters more than we love our freedom in Christ to do all sorts of things. We're called to love somebody that has a, a weak faith or a very immature faith. We're called to love them more than we love doing things on the weekends or whatever it is. Whatever it is that we're saying is kind of a moral gray area in our lives. And probably for every one of us, it's something different. We take up our cross every day and we put our desires to death on behalf of the kingdom. That's exactly what Jesus meant when he says, take up your cross every day and follow me. In 1 Thessalonians... Paul says this in chapter 5, I urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what's good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, and that's the key. You know, Paul's saying the same thing here. Do things that will build other people up. When you see somebody that's struggling with something, don't go beat them over the head with it and say, you're a dirty, filthy sinner and you need to straighten yourself up or we're not going to let you come back into the church because that's not how it works. Because if that was how it works, none of us would be here tonight. There isn't one of us. Not even Gail. And Paul says, but that's what we do. We bear with one another and we share each other's burdens. And the only way you can do that is by rejoicing constantly because God forgives you of your shortcomings and praying constantly for yourself, for your patience, for your your endurance, and praying for other people. Praying when they come to you and say, I'm struggling with this thing, whatever it is. Okay, let's pray right now. Not, I'll pray for you later. Because if you guys are anything like me, you'll forget. Pray right then. Let's pray right now. That's uncomfortable. Even when you've got a good friend, like I have, a, I have friends that work here at the church, so it's not uncomfortable. Like if they say, ah, I'd rather not pray, then we got a problem. But it's still, it's, it's kind of scary, even when it's somebody that works in a church in a ministry capacity, when they come and they say, I'm struggling with something right now, and it's been really hard, and I've kind of screwed up a little bit here and there. I've had some shortcomings. I've, kind of, I've given into a couple of things here and there. You know what? Let's pray about it right now. Let's pray about it right now. It's not going to be an instant fix, but boy, it sure gets you on your way. Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. That to me is the biggest part of this passage. Do not quench the Spirit because God's Spirit is trying to work through this body that we call a church. And really, in any sort of a group or gathering that we have where two or more people are joined in my name, there I am also. So if it's just two of you talking about things that you're going through, or maybe you have to go to somebody and say, hey, uh, I know that you are, this is kind of a gray area, but this is something that I've been praying, and it keeps coming up in my mind, and I feel like God wants me to talk to you about this. And it's, look, nobody wants to avoid this more than I do, but I, I see that if you continue doing this, like I can see this ending badly for you, and I don't want that to happen. Don't quench the Spirit. 
When you feel like the Spirit, when, when God's Spirit is prompting you to speak to somebody, or in my case, a lot of times prompting you to shut up, then do it. No matter how uncomfortable it feels, just do it. Don't diminish the power and the presence of the Spirit. And that's not to say that we can overpower the Holy Spirit. But God's good and He's kind. And if you ask Him to leave, He will. If you make God unwelcome, He will very graciously just leave. So do we love God and the people that He loves? more than we love our own comfort and desires. And that's a hard thing to answer. That's a hard thing for every one of us to answer. In John 8, Jesus is in the middle of a dispute here. In verse 31, he says, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold, my, hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So, The, the Greek word here is meno, and it means a lot of things. So what Jesus is saying is, if you hold fast to my teaching and my commands, if you don't look for loopholes, but you love Jesus so much that we shun things that might lead us astray, if you are completely filled with that Spirit... And, and you focus, or, or I, I want to focus on, like I said, on that word mino for a minute, because it means a lot, it's a very diverse word. It means things like endure in, or stay in, or continue in, or last, or live in, or abide, or be complete in. I really don't think that there are strong enough English adjectives to put the full meaning of this word on display for us. But if your whole life is consumed by Jesus' commands, being consumed with his commands is what's going to set you free. It's going to, it's going to set you free in the truth. And what is the truth? That only he's worthy of our time and our devotion. And only he can satisfy our hearts. The world can't do that with anything. All these gray areas, all these loopholes that we look for, all these things that we want to try to, you know, we want to try to have one foot in and one foot out. Um, he says, and notice, he doesn't say if you do these things, if you live in the truth, and I am the truth, if you live in that, then you'll be a believer. He doesn't say that, does he? He says, then you'll be a disciple. There's a big difference between being a believer and a disciple. In James 1, James says, don't merely listen to the word and deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at their face in a mirror and after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. We don't come to church, we don't go to Bible studies, we don't listen to Christian radio stations or podcasts or sermons or things like that because we want to learn more about Jesus. Learning more about Jesus is a great thing. People want to have all this knowledge, I want to know everything that there is to know about Jesus, but what Jesus' own little brother is saying right here is all of the knowledge in the world doesn't mean anything if you don't use it. Like, what's the best way to learn something? Just go do it, yeah. Jesus says this, you learn by doing. So don't just be a listener or a believer. Go be a doer and a disciple. Go use your faith. By doing things like what we talked about, building people up and loving them more than your own freedom to do certain things. Giving things up and saying, hey, you know what? It's okay for me to do whatever this thing is. Uh, you know, it's really not that big a deal. There is no specific law in the Bible against it, but it may lead somebody else astray. Is it really worth that? Or when somebody comes to you and they're having a tough time, say, Let's pray about it right now. 
Let's don't just talk about it. Let's don't just have you come and listen to me or, or me come to you and you listen to the things that I'm going through. Let's don't just do that. Let's pray about it. Let's do something. Back in 1 Corinthians, this is a, a big four-chapter kind of thought that Paul's going through. And in chapter 9, he says, When I preach the gospel, I can't boast since I'm, not, or since I'm compelled to preach the gospel. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, then I have a reward. And if not voluntarily, I'm simply discharging the trust committed to me. So we all have an obligation to go preach the gospel, to share the good news with people, to build people up and to love them the way that they need to be loved. We all have a duty to do that. And Paul says, I, I can't help but do it. Because other people have done it for me. Other people have, have, have poured into me that way, so now I can't help but do it that way. Elijah says it's like a fire that's shut up in my bones and if I don't get it out, then it's going to make me explode. And it will one way or the other. And then Paul says, don't do it out of compulsion. Don't do it because I'm standing up here tonight telling you, hey, you need to go share the good news and share the gospel with everybody. You do, but if you're only doing it because I told you to, then it's not going to mean anything to you or the people that you share it with. If you think you're not qualified for whatever reason, and it's lack of knowledge, lack of wisdom, inability to speak effectively, past sins, whatever it is, if, if that's the thing that's holding you back, then let me just assure you, you're right. <laughs> you probably don't have the knowledge or the wisdom. You probably don't have the ability to speak eloquently. You do have past sins that should disqualify you from these things, but every one of us does. Every one of us does. Anybody that has ever preached the gospel fits into that category. Every one of us does. So don't let that be the thing that stops you. If This is where Paul says, I will be whatever I have to be to whomever I have to be so that somebody might hear the gospel and be saved. I don't care. Uh, the only thing that I care about is that people, they, they don't necessarily see me and they're not... They're not drawn to me, they're drawn to Jesus. They see Jesus in everything that I do and say because he loves me so much and it shows in everything that I do and that's what they're drawn to. And Paul goes on to point out that we're no different than the Israelites under Moses. You know, they saw things, they saw things that you and I can't even imagine and they believed and what did they do immediately when they got through the Red Sea and Moses came down with the law? They built a golden calf. And then after Moses destroyed that, then they went into the, the land of Canaan, not the promised land, because these people never made it. But once they got in with all these Canaanites, they said, you know what? We saw God, we believed that he's there, but doggone it, the, the stuff that these Canaanites are doing sure looks like a lot more fun. So that's what we're going to do. We believe God, but this is what we're going to do. Big difference. And like I said, we face the same temptations that they did. We just have different packaging. If, um, you know, we're probably not going to be struck dead by the angel of death or bitten by venomous snakes. Um, you probably won't even die that day when you start doing things that are contrary to God's will. You're probably not even going to die on that day. But you will eventually. In chapter 10... Paul says, so you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what's common to mankind. So everybody's experienced the same thing. No temptation has overtaken you that is any different than what anybody else has ever dealt with. And God's faithful. He won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. And we fall for the same temptations. We want to be part of the culture. We want to compromise the truth for expediency uh, of this, that, or the other. And Paul closes with this, and I'm going to, I'm going to close with this too. Consider the people of Israel. 
Don't those who eat the sacrifices participate at the altar? So whatever sacrifice, whatever ceremony these people are being a part of, he says, aren't they being a part of something a little bit bigger? Like this isn't just dead wood and stone. Do I mean that the food sacrificed to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have part in the table of the Lord and in the table of demons. You cannot have one foot in and one foot out. You can't come to church and say, for the hour that I'm here every week, I'm going to be a certain way and I'm going to think a certain way, but by Monday morning, or at the very least by Tuesday morning, I'm going to look just like everybody else. I'm going to go back to living in the world. Paul says, you may feel like you're getting away with that. You've got one foot in the church and one foot in the world, but if that's what you're trying to do, you got both feet firmly planted in the world, and that's not going to end well. There are no loopholes and there are no gray areas. They don't exist. You can't celebrate demonic practices like any of these things that we've talked about. And you can't come to share in the sacrifice offered by the high priest who is Jesus if you're trying to do both. Paul warns the Corinthians under no uncertain terms here and a little bit later in the next chapter. He warns them under no uncertain terms You're going to come to one table or another. You're going to come to Jesus' table and we're going to share in communion right now. You're going to come to the table that Jesus has prepared or you're going to eat at the table of demons. You're going to drink the cup that Jesus has given His blood to fill so that you can be saved or you're going to drink the cup of wrath. For every one of us, it's our choice. He sternly warns that if you're going to piously incept, or accept Jesus' invitation tonight to this table that He has prepared with the full intent of going back to a sinful lifestyle tonight, tomorrow, later this week, then don't bother. In chapter 11, Paul says this, for whatever you eat, or for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, and that's communion, whenever you partake in this, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. So what Paul is saying here is before you accept this sacrament that Christ has purchased with His own blood, that He offers you freely, Search your hearts. Do you truly want to take a step closer to Christ today? Do you want to be filled with His grace and be transformed at your very core? Or is this just a ritual that we go through because it's something that you do when you're here? And what Paul's saying is, if that's the case, then pray about it. And if you don't want to take a step towards Christ, then don't come and drink from his cup and don't eat from his table. But any who call on the name of Jesus will be saved. And any who come to this table truly seeking Jesus are welcome. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was sharing a meal with his disciples in the upper room, with his friends, with these guys that were going and doing the work that he'd given them to do. At the beginning of the meal, he took the bread and he gave thanks for it and he blessed it. He said, this is the bread that represents God's provision for our ancestors when they were wandering in the desert. When they had nothing and I rained down bread so that they could eat every day. I am the bread of life. This is my body and it's broken for you. Take this and eat and every time you do, do it in remembrance of me. Then near the end of the meal, he took the cup of atonement, which symbolized the forgiveness of sin. This is the blood of the Passover lamb that they painted on their doorposts so that the angel of death would pass them over. And he said, this is my blood, 
because I am the Passover lamb. I am the only thing that covers sin. Take this and drink, and every time you do, do it in remembrance of me. God, we come tonight and we humbly thank you that you are all of these things for us and that every one of us has been simply a hearer. We've just heard the things we've wanted to know about you. We wanted to know just enough to be saved, but not enough to be changed. And you've told us very clearly that there's no such thing. So God, as we come tonight, we ask that your spirit would bless these elements and that as we receive them, that they are truly grace and forgiveness and mercy for us and that they would empower us in your salvation and in your truth. God, we thank you for providing these things even when we were your enemies. But anyone that comes and receives these things with a full heart tonight is called your friend. We thank you for these things tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.
We receive the benediction. Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, sharing with them all that I've given you, and surely I will be with you until the very end of the age. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures.